attending church, which was Rosebank Union, and I had a chat with Terry Ray, who was the senior pastor. I wanted to know, what am I letting myself in for? So I said to him, Terry, now be totally honest with me. What's the ministry like? And he said, Chris, to be honest, it would be absolutely wonderful if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> I thought he was joking then. <laughs> it didn't take me too many months in the role to realize that pastors are part of the people and that we're all in exactly the same place. We're just people in different stages of life. We're born again of the Spirit, but we are slowly being transformed. Slowly. And it's a two steps forward, three steps back thing sometimes. But we, we're moving towards being more like Christ. But in that process, we're as fallible as, as anybody else. And we all come into the church with baggage from the past. We all come in with our own particular past hurts and sensitivities and self centeredness and pride issues and all the rest of it. We bring that all with us. And now we come into this intimate relationship with several hundred people. Well, this is potential for strife. Another way to put it, there's going to be interpersonal problems when people are in close relationship, but they're all dealing with different things and they're all in different places in their Christian walk. But the church is not just a bunch of people. The church is the body of Christ. The church is a group of people called to be headed by Jesus and then filled by His Spirit to be light to the nations, to be salt to the world, to be glorious examples of love, acceptance and forgiveness. So we have to find ways of dealing with differences, of dealing with conflicts, of dealing with strife, that does not harm the church. Too often, just in my own generation, when I look back over the years, I see too many churches where, you, where things are happening and you look at them and, and the world says, what is that? Is that the church? Churches sue each other and take each other to court and split up and excommunicate willy-nilly and all sorts of stuff. No, we have to find a way. Because if we don't, then the church is hurt. And so are we, every one of us. Because we are part of this church. Now, the problem of conflict and differences within church life is as old as the church is itself. And we're going to be going through the book of Acts shortly, as was announced a couple of weeks ago. But if you just get as far as Acts chapter 6, I mean, there's only six chapters into Acts. The church there is living in a sort of an extended community. There were unusual circumstances. They were sharing everything. They were selling their property. They were sharing their food and all the rest of it. And in the context of that, the Greek-speaking Christians started to get all upset with the Aramaic-speaking Christians because their widows weren't getting enough grub. They thought they were being shortchanged on the food distribution. They were widows, they couldn't go out and work, so they were getting fed. But they said, no, this is not right. Those Aramaic ones, they're getting fat, boy. And us Greeks, we, we're getting thin. So the elders, well, in that time it would be apostles, appointed seven men to sort out the problem, to make sure everything was working. Now, if you can remember from the scripture, if you can't, I'll remind you. They set a criteria for who those men should be, what kind of qualifications they should have, which surprised me hugely when I first read it. You see, if I was going to be appointing seven guys to sort out a food problem with a whole bunch of widows, my criteria would be, must be young and good looking. <laughs> and male. Must be thin, because if he's not thin, then there's a danger that this oak's eating the food. You see. <laughs> Maybe somebody with admin skills. Somebody, you know, something like that. But that's not the criteria that was set. Here's what they said. Pick seven men full of the Spirit and wisdom. Full of the Spirit of God and wisdom to distribute food. That says it all. Because when we're dealing with interpersonal conflict within the church, we need God's wisdom. 
and we need his spirit. It's not an easy thing, but it's an absolutely essential thing. By the time we get to Acts chapter 15, we have Paul and Barnabas having such a sharp disagreement that they split up and never minister together again. It looks like they might have sort of kissed and made up at, by the end of Acts, but they didn't ever minister together again. Yet Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and Barnabas, whose very name means son of encouragement, was his mentor, brought him into ministry, developed him, and helped him, and accepted him. Yet they had a Barney. And it's right there in the scriptures for us to read. Later on, Paul writes to the Philippians about two ladies that just can't see eye to eye. And he basically says to the leadership of that church, please help those two ladies to stop fighting with each other. Because they're such dear people and they're so important for the ministry. And then the lowest point of all in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and says, why are you suing each other for goodness sakes? So they couldn't sort out their problems to the extent that they would go outside to the secular courts and in full public view of everybody, one Christian would be taking the other one to the cleaners. So the Lord Jesus gave them and he gave us a way of preventing this. It's really important and it's something that I want to deal with tonight. It's in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 35. I'm going to read to you just verses 15 through 20. I'm assuming they will pop up on the, the screen. 15 through to 20. Jesus speaking. He says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen... Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Tonight's not a sermon. So that means I'm not going to be giving examples, applications, case studies, not even hypothetical ones. I'm just going to take you through the scripture line by line, some places word by word, and say, this is what it means. Now let's grab hold of it and seek with all that we can to apply this in our lives. So um, this is my visual aid, but it's also a little bit more. I sit on it. Because I'm no ways am I going to go through a Bible study with all you guys slouching around in chairs, and I've got to stand here. Okay, verse 15 is where it starts. If your brother sins against you, Obviously, I don't have to tell you that brother does not mean male necessarily. This is not a gender-specific word. I mean, you could have equally have written if your brother or sister offends you. But the key here is that it's brother. It's a fellow Christian. This is not a process for the world, although I think it would work perfectly well in business and anywhere else. But it's not designed for that. It's designed for the family of God. If your fellow believer sins against you. And that word sin, again, is specific to things like offense or wrongs or trespasses against you. We're not talking here about if somebody in the church commits some kind of a moral fault that you think is unbiblical. Unfortunately, in some of the earlier translations of the Bible, the words against you are omitted. And it makes it sound as if it's that. You know, if, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault. So we've got to keep a beady eye on everybody. And if they take one step outside what we think is the right scriptural path, we'll go to them and say, excuse me, <clears throat> just, just, just observing. And if he says, fly a kite, we say, excuse me, I'm going to bring two others and we are going to sort you out. That's not what it is. 
This is not a process of church discipline or mob justice. This is a process of reconciliation and the resolution of conflict and stress. Now, it's very obvious that what I'm saying is the correct understanding because in verse 21, Peter says to Jesus, how many times must I forgive my brother if he offends against me? See, it's quite clear why he's asking that question. And Jesus says, uh, Peter says, should I forgive him seven times? And Jesus says, no, not seven, 77 times. So this context makes it crystal clear that we're talking here about interpersonal resolution of issues. Verse 15 goes on and says, Go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Go. A go means go. It means get off behind and go and eyeball to eyeball. That's what it means. It doesn't mean telephone. It doesn't mean WhatsApp. It doesn't mean SMS. It doesn't mean Google Messenger, Facebook Messenger, and it doesn't mean email. Unless those things are absolutely necessary, you might be at a distance, in which case you've got to communicate like that. Or you might want to put something in writing to prepare the way for this eyeball to eyeball. Some information, or maybe you're just so tied up in the immediate future that you have to say, hey, let's set something up in the, in the future in a week's time or whatever it is. But the whole idea here is whether it takes a day or a week or a month, the idea is to create that opportunity for face-to-face -face time, heart-to-heart eye to eye. And then it says, go and show him her, his fault. Now, this does not mean go and read him the riot act. My brother, I've just come speaking the truth and love you, understand? I've just come to just basically lecture you for 15 minutes and then I hope you'll apologize and we can call this thing over. Doesn't mean that at all. It means Explain your point of view. Tell him how the offense has affected you. Explain the background and ask him to talk to you about what were the assumptions that he or she made? What gave rise to this? Maybe there was a miscommunication. Maybe there was wrong information. Maybe there was something that had happened just before that that you weren't aware of and the other person wasn't aware of. So it's to explain. And key here is just the two of you. Go and show him his fault just between the two of you. No one else present. And that's really important. A group might have been involved. This offense might have offended a whole group. Or it might have been done in public, where there a lot of people were affected. But this first meeting must be one-on-one. -on -one. If it's a group, leader of the group goes to that person or the person most affected goes to that person and tries to sort it out. The group can get involved later. There can be discussions later and all the rest of it. But it must be one-on-one. -on -one. There's no recording devices present. <laughs> Just heart-to-heart, eye-to-eye. Verse 15 goes on. If he listens to you, and listen here how this verse ends. You have won your brother over. This is the purpose of this process. It's not to establish guilt. It's not to nail the brother. It's not to get some kind of vengeance. It's to win the brother or sister over so that unity and harmony may be restored between yourselves and thus to the church. Because if there's a breakdown in communication between members, then it will affect large parts of the church. It will affect whole cell groups, ministry areas, teams, friends of friends, and all the rest of it. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Listens doesn't mean uh, he's able to decode the words you're saying. You know, I've, I've said my say and the person nodded and says, well, okay, what, whatever, you know, blah, blah, talk to the hand. It means listen to. If your brother that you're talking to, 
he's engaged with you and he's actually hearing what you're saying and you hearing what the person is saying, then you can win your brother over because you can come back into one accord. This is the goal, to restore relationships. A part that's often overlooked, by the way, is that by using this method and, and creating this one-on-one -on -one opportunity, you can actually help the offender to change and to be more like Jesus. Often people will do things that they're not conscious of. Sometimes people are not even conscious of offending. Or they're not aware enough of themselves to understand that the way that they are communicating things is harsh, abrasive, breaks down, is hurtful or whatever it is. So it's really useful if you have a genuine heart-to-heart -heart chat. The other person can maybe, even if they don't admit it to you, can maybe say, oh, I better, I better listen to that. Us married guys, we've got uh, the easier path for this because we go home and we say to our wives, do you think he could be right? And she always says, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we can respond and change. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's got to be up in the 90%. I would say over 90% of interchurch conflicts within a church are resolved in this first step. If it's done with the right attitude, and with a heart that wants to reconcile, 9 out of 10 will result in reconciliation. Because we're Christians, we're believers, we belong to the one Lord, we're filled with the same Spirit, we're under the headship of Christ, we're part of the same church. Surely there's got to be a really good of percentage chance that we're going to be able to sort things out. So here is sobering question that I ask you to consider as I've asked myself to consider carefully. If we know all this and Jesus himself gave us this process and it's so effective, why don't we follow it? Because in my own experience, looking back over years of ministry, it seems to me that most of the time folk don't follow this. They, in fact, will go and talk to everybody else other than the offending person. It used to be telephone calls. One to the other, to the other, to the other, spreading the bad news that so-and-so is an absolute horrible person. I said the following to you. Nowadays, it's WhatsApp groups that catch fire with this kind of thing. We speak about it in cell groups. The whole cell group is getting an earful of the problem we're having with Joe Soap or whatever it is, but Joe Soap it doesn't get spoken to. Why? Could it be that we're more concerned with justifying ourselves, expressing our outrage at our offended pride, than we are with actually unifying? and restoring fellowship. I'm not going to try and attempt to answer that question, let's answer it for ourselves. But it seems to me it's a question that needs to be answered. For Jesus has given us a process which is fantastic. Why don't we use it? If step one fails, the Lord gave us step two, which is found in verse 16. He said, but if he will not listen, take one or two others along. So will not listen again doesn't mean to, that he just turns his face away and says, don't speak to me, you creep. It means he's listening, but he's not taking in what you're saying. You know, the eyes remain steely, glinty. And you can see inside, behind his eyes, he's saying, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. No, if he hears you, then there's an interchange, there's a, an exchange that's taking place, and there's some kind of empathy that starts occurring and some kind of understanding. But if he won't, or she won't, then take one or two others. Take mature believers. Just like the first deacons were men who were filled with the Spirit and wisdom, find two people who are filled with the Spirit and wisdom 
maybe even who witnessed what was happening, maybe. You have a, a knowledge of that. Take them. question, of course, is what are they supposed to do when they go? And we come into that right now. Step one for these folk that you bring with you is to talk to the offender and you. They're not there firstly to act as witnesses for a potential formal third step. Their first task is to reason with you, to help you reflect, to say, are you hearing so-and-so correctly here, George, John, Mary, whoever it is? Don't you think maybe that person's got a point? Come on, why don't we pray together about this? Why don't we try and find a solution? Something else happens. When we are confronted with the need to take one or two other people for a second meeting, Guess what starts going on in our heads? Um, I better be really sure of what's happening here because I'm going to look like a real prize pampoon in front of yet another two people if I'm just now shooting off half cocked and I haven't thought this one through. That's the first thing. Second thing that goes into our heads is is it worth it? Is this thing so important that I now have to waste another two people's time and another several hour meeting of dealing with this? Or should I not just forgive as Jesus instructs me to forgive? So it brings us to that point of forgiveness often real quick when we are confronted with the necessity of the step. Jesus spoke about forgiving 77 times. I mean, he's really making it quite clear. He's also reversing an Old Testament pattern because Peter said, should I forgive seven times? And he said, no, 77 times. That comes out of Genesis 4.24, where Cain was avenged seven times for the wrong done against him. And Lamech, one of his descendants, was avenged 77 times. So, Built into this, and it would have been understood by the people of his day, built into this is, is a wonderful message. Jesus saying, this is not about vengeance. This is about forgiveness. This is about not, it's not about nailing your brother. This is not about making sure that he pays some kind of a social price for his abominable behavior towards me. It's about forgiveness. And to make it absolutely clear, in verses 25 to 35, Jesus goes on and tells a long story about a man who had a servant who owed him a fortune. The servant defaulted and couldn't pay. Came to the boss and pleaded and said, please let me off. And the boss forgave him and let him off his entire debt. He turned around, walked out of that room, went straight to a lesser servant who owed him a little bit of money and beat him around the ears and threatened to throw him into jail. The boss man heard about this, calls him back in and says, you wicked, wicked servant, I forgave you much and you could not forgive the little. So now I'm going to throw you into jail and not that man that you've been threatening. Again, his message is clear. Guys, we have been forgiven everything. Christ Jesus died on the cross of Calvary because of our blatant rebellion in the face of God following our own patterns, our own desires, our own purposes, walking in flagrant disregard for him and for eternity. And he's forgiven us that. And that forgiveness continues day after day when we sin, when we do things that are wrong. We come to him as his children. We say, please, Father, forgive me. And he does. That's his promise. If you will confess your sins, he is good and faithful to forgive us our sins. Why then can we not forgive somebody who has just offended us for a short while over something which is actually not that important? We can't say that Jesus is not making it really clear to us what's going down here. The second thing that these two witnesses do is to then act as testimonies if it has to go to step three. 
Because in the law laid out in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, it said everything must be established in the mouths of two or three witnesses. So if it has to go to step three, which is taking it to the church, then there need to be two people or three people who can say it's absolutely true, this is what happened, and I know the process has been followed. I know every effort has been made to, to resolve this. If then there's still failure, the Lord gives us step three, and this is in verse 17. It says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Refuses, stubbornly resists, won't acknowledge guilt, won't acknowledge culpability, will not apologize. I couldn't care. Do what you want. Sue me. See if I care. Kind of thing. Then take it to the church. Now, church means whatever is the acceptable form of church government for that particular congregation. So if you were part of a congregational church, like some of the, some Baptist churches, where you don't have uh, one or two leaders or a plurality of elders, you just have a church meeting once a month. Everybody comes to the church meeting, and you resolve everything at the church meeting. That would then mean bring it to that church meeting. We don't have that form of government here. We have a form of government when there are appointed and anointed men of God who form a plurality, a team of elders, led by a lead elder and a pastor. We have to break them to that. That then represents the church. So if all else fails, basically, we then go to the eldership, or one of the, one of the elders who will take it to the team, and say, look, I can't go any further on this. Please now won't you help us resolve this as a, a lost, lost attempt. And then Jesus went on, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I want you to listen to the words carefully. And if he refuses to listen, you treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. This is not about excommunication. This is not about the elders saying, right, you're out. It's about our final response, having gone through the whole process of trying to reconcile, is to treat that person as we would anybody else in the world. Now, how do you treat a non-believer? Do you treat that person with disdain? Hopefully not. Do you treat a non-believer with aggression or violence or anger? No, you treat a non-believer with dignity, respect and consideration. But what you don't do you don't extend trust. You don't extend intimate fellowship. And you do not extend commitment. So the final outshot of this process, if it's unsuccessful, is having to take an attitude with others in the church which says, it's fine, you'll be here and I'll be here, and I will smile and I will greet you. And if you're sick, I'll pray for you. But I will not entrust myself to you any further. I will not trust you. I will not commit myself, my energy, my heart to you. That's the bottom line of all of this. So it's a three-step process. One, two, and three. And if we follow it, I believe that we will almost invariably bring restitution and restoration, harmony, into the church, and the church will benefit, and we will, because we are part of the church. I can think of only two exceptions, possible exceptions. There might be more. Two of them are this. If there is pending violence, imminent violence, imminent abuse, now can that happen in a church? Yeah, you know, with drug addiction problems and substance abuse, it can happen. If there's a threat of that kind of thing, you can't go and sit down and have this reasonable heart-to-heart -heart of the person. You've got to act. You've got to go straight to step three and say to the leadership, we have a problem. This dude's running around with a shotgun. And we, we better sort this out. The other exception is where step two sometimes have to, has to be skipped. And that's when the offender is a leader in the church. Very hard to take two witnesses when you're dealing with a leader. I mean, who are those witnesses going to be? And how's he going to avoid not 
getting all prickly and defensive. But we still must go step one. We must still go to that leader and say, I've got a problem, you know, let's talk about it. But if he doesn't listen, normally one would then have to go to the to the eldership because that middle bit is probably just not going to be productive. But those would be the odd exception to a wonderful and glorious process that Jesus has laid out for us. Finally, it talks in verses 18 through 20 about binding and loosing. What you bind will have been already bound in heaven. It's actually in the past tense. What you loose will already have been loosed in heaven. A good news here, this has got absolutely diddly squat to do with demons and spiritual warfare. This has got to do with the subject matter. It's not a misplaced verse or two. It's in the context of this passage. You see, the rabbis of the time had the privilege and the duty to determine what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. If they bound something, they prohibited it. If they loosed something, they allowed it to happen. In terms of doctrine, in terms of practice. What Jesus is saying is you know what, if you do what I have instructed you to do, I will back you up. It's already been agreed in my throne room then. But you know, if you don't, you will not have my approval. You will not have my backing. You will not have my authority. If we would follow this process, we could come to the end of it with a clear conscience and say, I'm prepared to stand before Jesus, look him in the eye and say, Lord, I've done everything that I can to restore unity. And he will say, well done, my son, my daughter. I'm pleased with you. If we don't, don't expect to get that response. Last point. Remember the objective. The objective of, of this Jesus conflict resolution process, you should call it the church JCRP. <laughs> the whole purpose is reconciliation and unity. The whole purpose is an opportunity to express love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And surely this is our reasonable response in the light of the love, acceptance, and forgiveness that's been shown us by the very head of the church. May God bless us and be gracious to us and smile upon us and lift up the light of his countenance upon us and help us down this path. It's such a simple process, but it's actually quite hard because all the old person in us rises up, offense, pride, wanting to see what we think is justice done. We have to subordinate that to the greater purpose, which is reconciliation and unity. Amen. Family, you can stand as we go into a time of worship.